Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this um, seminar of the history um, of political economy and, and finance research cluster at the Open University Business School. Uh, welcome everybody. Today we have Professor Gary Dinsky, which is Professor of Applied Economics at uh, Leeds University Business School since 2012. He previously held uh, various academic positions in the US and uh, he has been economic analyst for the Legal Services Organization of Indiana and Staff Director of Fiscal Analyst for the uh, Democratic Caucus in the Indiana State Senate. And he is now advising uh, the Debt and Development Division of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Um, uh, Gary Dinsky has been visiting scholar in University and Research Center in Brazil, Bangladesh, Japan, Korea, Great Britain, Greece, and India. And he has published uh, numerous books, articles, and chapters, and studies on uh, basically uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of topics, but. Um, uh, among these, banking, financial fragility, uh, urban development, credit market discrimination, and uh, Latin American and, uh, and Asian financial crisis, exploitation, housing finance, the uh, subprime lending crisis, financial regulation, the eurozone crisis, and, and many other and many other topics. So, and these have been published uh, widely in journals such as the American Economic Review, Journal of Economic Literature. Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, the Cambridge Journal of Economics, Environment and Planning A, uh, to, say, uh, to say a few. Um, he is part of various uh, leading journals and editorial boards. And we had the pleasure of having Gary presenting his work last year uh, within uh, one of our department's uh, seminar. And we are even happier to have it again. Uh, this time with uh, within our HYPE seminar series. And today we present a paper titled The Neoliberal Global Triad and the Latin American uh, Financial Trap, Contending Explanation of Microfinancial Crisis. So thank you very much, uh, Gary, for joining us today. I'm sure uh, everyone will enjoy your presentation and um, uh, there will be uh, time for a Q&A session um, at the end. So thank you, Gary, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks again for joining us. All right, my pleasure and let's Let's load this screen and see if we get it up. And let me then renew my picture of you, Danielli. Are we good? Is it up and running? Yeah, all good. Thanks. OK, excellent. And I'll keep the chat screen up. So if there's anything, uh, we'll, we'll be able to use that, but also perhaps uh, voice contact. Uh, just to say, uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a uh, lots of opportunities to explore issues. I always like to see the way that things connect. And I have to say that um, the some of these areas of research I'd like to come back to. There's And, and there are things that, for example, are hard to find now uh, because they, they go back to uh, the 1980s. There was an entire debate with John Romer on the uh, theory of Marxian theory of exploitation that um, I, I really enjoyed at the time and other other pathways. I came uh, of, of intellectual research. There's a, a restlessness and a desire to connect the dots that's part of, I guess, my journey. I came to the, U the UK after years of being really focused on California and California policy issues, hoping to try to understand more about the global system. And so this particular paper is a an example of that. And one benefit of coming to LEAD has been the chance to work with amazing doctoral students. And uh, this paper is co-authored with Nicole uh, Chirpa-Vielma, who is now uh, writing her thesis uh, with uh, on uh, some aspects of Latin American finance and macro uh, at Leeds. And she is in that part of her thesis where it's time to just crank out the chapters. So I'll be doing this presentation on my own so that uh, she didn't have to worry about putting the slides together. Uh, however, this is joint work and as yet just a working paper that we hope to refine. Now, uh, where it comes from, the, the ideas here, let me let me get this so I can move the, oh, okay, um, is, is in some sense from the articles uh, and, and writings that, that are about safe assets. 
and kind of I had a very adverse reaction to this literature on the shortage of safe assets um, and realized that the the discussions about trilemmas and dilemmas and all of that uh, in global political economy had moved on in ways that were taking a very odd, odd turn. What I had found um, in my own work on the subprime crisis was that actually you you once you see mainstream uh, explanations uh, taking root and those going back to that edifice of uh, general equilibrium, sometimes you things go through a looking glass. Things start to turn backwards and you start to blame the people who got the exploitative loans rather than the banks that made those exploitative and predatory loans for the subprime crisis, for example. The same thing I saw happening with this shortage of safe assets, the entire situation was going backwards. So I th we, we, as we were discussing, we said, let's, let's uh, try to turn this around. In a nutshell, here's what we're arguing today. You know, we see the succession of financial crises um, around the world, and uh, there's been arguments that have evolved from the kind of moral hazard based arguments um, in the prior to the great financial crisis to what are now these arguments about global dynamics and global problems. And uh, specifically, uh, these have, uh, in, in both cases, uh, led to policy interventions that are doomed to fail because they don't take proper account of the structural imbalances involved. We, what we do here is to bring in two factors ignored in both the shortage of safe assets and global financial cycles literatures. That is to say, the importance of power and the role of aggregate demand and of Keynesian perspectives uh, to sort of understand differently the global geography of macro financial processes. We, we use the terminology of a neoliberal global triad, uh, which consists of the hegemony of the US dollar, a shadow banking system uh, centered on some too big to fail US mega banks, and the shifting lo global locus of manufacturing as to describe this triad and to try to understand the position of different countries inside it. And in particular, we pay attention to Latin America's dilemma, which is that Latin America is outside of the power nexus of both ends of this triad, as we'll describe it. And that is why we see some of the perverse things we see, which include the fact that the nations of Latin America, by and large, have current account deficits and yet are over borrowing systematically so as to build up their foreign reserves. And you ask why, and it has to do again with global power. So let's just uh, start with an empirical baseline. There is a database that's been assembled by uh, numerous people. Well, this in this case, the IMF database is among them, uh, Levan and Valencia. They've got now several papers spanning uh, actually 12 years. And uh, what they do is they've tried to you know, lay out here the different crises. This is their picture of uh, overall financial crises. And notice that the scale here uh, goes up to about 20 or 23 financial uh, crises of various kinds divided by groups, banking, currency, and sovereign debt. Now, what I'd like you to do, we're gonna turn and do our next picture on Latin America. And notice first the change in scale uh, oh, I'm sorry. First, we'll just take a look at uh, Eastern Europe, Russia, Turkey. Um, and just to say, you know, here's an example of the kind of thing when you break it down. And you can see that if you if you look at these crises, they're very heavily concentrated in the period of transition from the socialist bloc to the capitalist bloc, so to speak, of the global economy. Um, OK, this is the one I, I, I'd like to highlight here. Uh, the fact that, you know, what we have here is uh, the, the parallel picture to the one that we had before. Uh, so actually, if you can look at that, goes up to 25 and so on. And notice the in particular, just have a look at the red marks that the, the, the it's not an elegant picture, but the banking crisis in red, because I, I, this is going to be something that we're going to need when we come back and look at Claudio Borio's argument specifically. Um, and now look here, 
I tried to make the red mark really uh, big because basically what you see is there's not much to report. We do have some banking crises, that's for sure. But notice that after 1998, you see none, actually. Well, actually, it looks like there's a couple. Uh, but basically, it's not about banking crises. It's mostly about currency crises and sovereign debt crises when it comes to Latin America. Uh, when we break it down, what we see there, of course, are these famous incidents. Here's a different map with or the same map with some labeling. We see the Latin American debt crisis uh, triggered by Mexico's default in 82. We see the tequila crisis of Mexico in 94 and then the Argentina currency crisis and the, you know, all of that in 90. Well, there's the going for 91 and then 2002 and so on. Argentina, of course, remains pretty deeply in crises. And what I'd like to just highlight here is something that will become apparent when you when we get into the mainstream explanations. Look at the predominance of financial crises of all kinds in Latin America and in the Caribbean compared to other regions of the world. Now, there's a lot that could be said here, uh, but just notice that in Western Europe, you see those 20 crises in the 2000s. That's pretty much the subprime crisis there. Eastern Europe, again, as we saw, you see those transitional crises. And in East Asia, you see the uh, big blot of uh, crises in uh, 1990s. And that's something that, of course, reflects the East Asian crisis. But Latin America, you see it all the way through, not just the 80s, but all the way through, we see a lot of events. And our question, in some sense, is why? Why this vulnerability? Why do we see this? OK, um, and I, I just uh, want to say we see this. We're going to see this because we're going to look at history. And I just want to do a page. I can't resist uh, my favorite all time graph. Um, I was able to get some data from the BIS, uh, the uh, Bank for International Settlements, the big banks that report to the BIS. And for some time, not forever and not anymore, uh, basically after the Latin American debt crisis and until uh, the early 2000s, there was reporting on who held claims by country uh, and by, by area of the world. And uh, what we see here, in the case of Latin America, is that it's Spanish banks and American banks that are predominant. In graphs I won't show you, you would see that in Africa, it's been German banks and French banks that have been in the lead. And in Asia, it's been Japanese banks in the US. So you kind of see legacies of, uh, and the UK was also prominent uh, in Africa. So you, you see legacies of colonialism uh, that are part of it. We drag our history forward with us our history turns into structure and structure governs a lot of what happens today. And just to let's skip this one. This is just a proof that there was a lost decade in Latin America. But let's let's not look at this. Let's move on and get into the arguments. OK, we start with mainstream explanations prior to 80 before the 82 debt crisis. Uh, we actually had so that that's the crisis in Latin America going way back. Uh, to the early 80s and then the 70s, we had explanations when we talked about debt crisis or problems in nations. We talked about structural conditions. Uh, Carlos Diaz Alejandro had some classic pieces and uh, Paul Krugman, the kind of uh, shape changing, you know, chameleon of economics, um, wrote a very famous paper on first generation currency crisis that basically it's weak fundamentals that can lead to severe de devaluations. Now, after 82, remember that's a period, those years in which the structural Keynesian models are being replaced by dynamic equilibrium macro models. Initially then the uh, business cycle model, real business cycle, and now eventually the DSGE models. Uh, and so the new Keynesians uh, who wanted to hang on to the idea that markets could be less than perfect they were really working with game theoretic models in those days, and in particular, principal agent problems with asymmetric information uh, along the way were very prominent. These were eventually cooked into the consensus model that Michael Woodford uh, put on offer, uh, kind of having accepted Ben Bernanke's surrender. Uh, 
um, at some point in, in the 1990s. But uh, basically, being a little cynical there, of course, but basically what we had to explain the debt crisis of the 1980s were these country-specific problems that didn't talk about structure. They talked about willingness to pay, moral hazard problems. And in fact, we have these very odd pieces of work by the now critic of the uh, global system, Stiglitz and two of his co-authors, who talked about the problem of country risk as being due to a, a, in a, an unwillingness to pay because penalties were set too low. Um, and so there's this kind of paradoxes of sovereign lending. Why does it ever occur if these borrowers are going to be unreliable? Now, notice that the detail about all of the aspects of this lending just disappear. Was it really Mexico that uh, took the loans? No, it wasn't. It was companies inside Mexico, Pemex, etc. Uh, and it was inside Brazil, uh, Petrobras and other com uh, com companies that took these loans that then ended with the sovereign uh, countries once they went bad. But the notion that there was a bargain and uh, that, that the borrower nation is something that can just be seen as a simple agent in, in, in a relationship with a lender is of course an institutional lie. Uh, but this was actually, uh, Krugman took a version of the Eaton Gersowitz Stiglitz model and built his famous little model of crony capitalism in explaining the East Asian crisis. And uh, Mark Eaton uh, then uh, built his sovereign debt framework. Now, Red, you know, there's this idea here, right, that, you know, things go along and then there's problems and then we recreate the problems. There are other ways of looking at these problems. These are not what we'll look at today. Uh, there is uh, Darity and Horn talked about global financial market segmentation uh, and working with Manuel Pastor, we came up with some ideas about class conflict uh, inside the borrower country that could be part of it. Um, and then just generally speaking, Eichen, Green and Lindert just said, you know, what, you know, how come there's re repeat default borrowers if indeed uh, that moral hazard argument is so important. So now what happened though, was that by the 90s, uh, bank lending crises are becoming uh, more and more frequent. They're matched by currency crises. And IMF researchers start to go more general in their view. Uh, in particular, Demogurk, Kunt, and Detriarch, uh, Detra, I, sorry for that, Detra Giace, uh, um, they, they wrote a couple of important papers. There were other players, um, but basically they, in their 2005 paper, they explained what was going on at the IMF. With the, in particular, this was motivated by the East Asian crisis, which was such a complete surprise for the IFIs. With the arrival of the 90s, financial crises in which the banking sector played center stage and macroeconomic consequences were sharp and at times protracted became more and more widespread. Bank fragility was pervasive and multifaceted a phenomenon ripe for more systematic empirical investigation. So these researchers, they began assembling time series of cross-border financial crises and, and put these and then looked using time series methods, looked at patterns and, you know, and, and for explanations there, they didn't really come up with much. You know, they, I mean, you have a database that compares, you know, India 1966 with uh, Brazil 19 you know, uh, at 82, et cetera. I mean, it's a pretty dispersed database and it sort of, it sort of turns history into a history and makes it a, a statistical data series. Um, uh, but basically what they show is that there's a, you know, no one factor. Uh, you can see that uh, those two authors uh, from the IMF uh, actually come up with one conclusion in 1998 and a different conclusion in 2005. Uh, like the finance and growth literature, they end up kind of scratching their heads uh, about what the relationship really is. Um, and meanwhile, other theorists uh, turn to other explanations that, again, uh, look at factors external to borrower countries. Now, there, this kind of sets the way uh, 
for uh, basically a shift from since there was that, you know, that that those database approaches of the IMF with each nation state recording a line of data with various observations doesn't really lead to much. And it open and that combined with the recurrence of financial crises leads to the um, emergence of a new stage in investigation. This is the stage where we are now, where we turn from the fitness or willingness of nation states as to be good borrowers, which was the road taken either structurally in the old days or by the principal agent uh, modelers in the 80s and 90s. And now we sh shift instead to the very logic of global cross-border global financial flows as such. Now, the reference for looking at cross-border global financial flows is, of course, the work of uh, Fleming and Mundell going back to the 1960s, where they were playing with the idea of impossible trinity. The fact that um, a country that had an independent monetary policy and fixed exchange rates, as well as open financial borders, would have an incompatible mix. One of those things would have to go because it would be impossible to sustain all three. And you know this lead, led into a debate even amongst those participants. Fleming, in his original contributions, saw financial openness as a booster for domestic policy choice. Mundell saw this as a way of ensuring something like efficient financial markets in the open economy setting. Um, but in any case, what we've seen is the adaptation of this point of view, this notion of thinking about what's possible and not possible, what triggers move what things, uh, many celebrations. I should say that uh, the IMF is quite proud of the fact that it was the home for the foundation of the Mundell Fleming model and all of that, and not to mention the uh, global monetarist perspective that Mundell went on to found. Um, and so this turns into this new set of work, and there's kind of two aspects of it. Um, there's the work, first of all, on global financial cycles that kind of comes first. Uh, I've got a 2012 reference there, but as long ago as 2005, uh, Claudio Borio of the BIS is exploring different aspects of of what is, is going to become his global financial cycle uh, hypothesis. And what he basically argues is that, you know, you have these self-reinforcing feedback loops between asset prices and collateral values um, inside. Now, he's talking about inside any country and thinking in particular of a country that might have received external capital, uh, finance or FDI. And basically, if the authorities react to the financial cycle and the fact that asset prices are going up, everything is good and so on, then they won't react to the business cycle, they'll react to the financial the financial cycle. One should, should note that in the era of the global factory, there are countries where the business cycle has been profoundly transformed um, as the relationship between production and consumption has become a lot more distant and uh, connected by supply chain rather than by local factories. That said, he talks about unfinished business cycles uh, can be problematic and can lead to asset booms and busts and more severe business cycles. He's actually there uh, thinking a little bit about the so-called Greenspan put of the early 2000s. Now, Pesari and Ray, Helene Ray, uh, emerges as the other uh, protagonist of this literature on uh, global financial cycles. And they do lots of, uh, you know, kind of time series econometrics and other analyses. And what she and her co-authors find is that there's lots of co-movements. Uh, there's co-movements, gross capital flows, bank leverage, credit creation, and so on. And when they put in, uh, you know, controls for monetary policy, and fixed exchange rates or or moderated exchange rates, et cetera, they don't get much. So they conclude that there is a dilemma, not a trilemma. Uh, developing countries are not actually able to set an independent monetary policy and then let's say 
um, open their financial bar borders and in their view, um, allow the exchange rate to fluctuate as they will. Um, basically their point, and that's, for example, that would be what say a country like Brazil has been trying to do uh, for, I guess, for since the coming of the Heiau. Um, and they would say, no, no, it doesn't work. Developing countries only choice is how open they want to be to capital flows. Nothing else they do matters. So you look at that impossible trinity, it's just an on off switch. Your independent, your monetary policy doesn't matter. Whether or not you try to fix your exchange rates isn't going to matter. The only thing that's going to matter for you is whether you're opening or trying to close your financial borders. Now, if that's the case, if there is something like a cycle, and you have to say that, right, I mean, it's kind of recognizing the power of unchained uh, financial globalization, which of course brings us this world of financialization and brings us this world of immense and hyper leveraged global financial flows. So what's behind these flows? Now, this is where we get into the other star of the show that I mentioned was kind of at least my trigger for some of this thinking. Uh, well, one explanation came from Ben Bernanke, 2005. Bernanke, of course, um, looking around as he's as we're seeing, you know, the uh, the the story uh, emerge at that point. Probably Ben knew uh, that the you know the the crisis was coming in the U.S. But he blames the savings glut in Asia. He you know the argument that China's suppression of aggregate demand leads to excess savings that seek out U.S. assets and enable the current account deficit. I would just note that um, actually this notion that there's excess savings, if you follow it through, you follow that down the rabbit hole, that takes you back to the classical model, not a Keynesian demand-led model. And uh, the fact that this is a supposed new Keynesian uh, saying these things is rather an embarrassment. But leaving that aside, it, it, I, I would interpret actually Bernanke's statement in 2005, since he was then head of the Federal Reserve, um, I, if I remember well, it was a political statement, right? Let's blame China. Um, of course, that's become a game. Um, but the other explanation, the one that's really seized the imagination of economic researchers now, is the immediately post-crisis argument made by Caballero, Krishnamurti, and others. They argue that why do we see the crisis? Why do we see the all this bad debt crashing down in the financial markets on their knees and everything bad and the subprime uh, loaded uh, securities, you know, going down in value and the banks in danger of failing, etc. Well, why we see that is that this is all a, a reaction to the fact that there was a excess global demand for riskless assets. OK, so here's the story. Foreign savers um, like domestic savers, all savers, want a combination, they, is the premise, of risky and riskless assets. And so uh, basically, where do you find safe assets? Well, there's a shortage. Why? Because, right, we've been in some decades, these are the neoliberal decades in particular, in which many nation states have undergone uh, sovereign risk, sovereign debt crises, and many problems, especially in the developing world and developing economy world. And so basically foreign savers come into the U.S. to find those safe assets. Those are, of course, U.S. treasuries, bonds and bills. And what that does is load in savings to the United States, which basically, you know, drives the it changes the relative prices of risky and safe assets in the U.S., pours over some in the portfolio, you know, balancing imagination of this story, it pours over some wealth into riskier assets. More risky assets can be afforded. They are done. And as they are done, what that, what that, what they're, as they are made, that leads to a situation in which basically too much risk is taken on and we're in danger of what the very crisis that is going to in fact happen. And so uh, Helene Ray uh, actually describes the uh, the story here uh, 
uh, very nicely because she too, in her thinking, relies on a portfolio balance model. Indeed, the neoclassical growth models behind many of our economic intuitions regarding why the free flow of capital could be beneficial. With this model, financial integration brings improvements in allocative efficiency. Capital flows to places with the highest marginal product and better risk sharing. Interestingly, gains tend to be small. Now that's Helene Ray explaining why we see the trends that she sees, why capital is going where it, it can. Um, and actually that same explanation though, uh, actually turns on its head the, again, as did say recently the arguments by uh, Calamiris and Haber in their uh, really awful book, uh, Fragile by Design, uh, it turns on its head that argument that basically now blames the subprime crisis on the borrowers, not the lenders. Same thing here. Why did this crisis happen? Well, they got too enthusiastic and the government uh, somehow uh, right, see, it plays right into the Calamira's argument. The government somehow allowed these riskier loans to be made. What were they thinking? Bad government, why did you make the, through the Community Reinvestment Act, why did you make your banks make these loans to these poor and risky people, many of whom happen to be uh, people of color? My gosh, what were you thinking, right? So the whole thing kind of fits. And uh, as Dominguez points out in a Brookings panel, uh, this blames underdeveloped markets and shows that the U.S. has nothing to do with anything. Now, I, I just note here for the for completeness that uh, Borio, before we get to our argument, uh, Borio uh, has this idea of it's, it's Borio is more Keynesian, and so he talks about the idea of um, excessively expansionary monetary policy. Uh, which basically exacerbates the inability of the uh, local authorities to prevent the buildup of financial imbalances or these cycles. And uh, basically what he is doing with this kind of Keynesian argument is arguing that it was regulators like Bernanke that were behind the thing. That's why I had you take a look at the, the lack of importance of banking crises compared to currency and sovereign debt crises in Latin America, because this was not the problem in Latin America. Borio's argument applies to the US case, yes, but doesn't apply to the Latin American case. Now, our alternative understanding turns on uh, two things that are overlooked in these frameworks. First is we, we need to substitute a Keynesian or post Keynesian uh, as you like it, uh, for a new classical macro framework. Uh, and secondly, we need to think about power. In particular, what's going to be important here, I'm not going to highlight the Keynesian demand side argument there. Uh, this wasn't clearly articulated in the draft that I uh, passed over to our, our colleagues uh, in, in, the, in the Open University. Um, and, I, 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 and when I've shown it to non-economists, they don't get it. Uh, they don't see the classical Keynesian as clearly as some of us do. So I think that requires further development. But the one part of the Keynesian that really is clear is this idea of a flight to safety due to the crumbling of confidence or conventional beliefs, um, as opposed to the fact that you're making coolly and calmly making portfolio choices. I need some safe assets. I need some risky assets. It's what I want. And that's not like that, right? I mean, things don't move in that way. And again, there's probably a way that we can capture better the uh, the kind of real-time panics that can be part of this apparent lunge for safe assets. Something about the timing, right? Now, in terms of power asymmetries, again, I think an underdeveloped idea, it's an idea that I've been playing with, especially with Nina Kaltenbrunner, this idea that maybe there's something like real space as real time and real space is something that we you know, kind of were inspired by Sheila Dow, her notion that there's credit starvation that can happen within a nation in its peripheral areas. Uh, this is the same kind of dynamic that I've observed in uh, thinking about bank redlining in inner city communities in the US. And uh, this idea that there's power asymmetries 
who has access to credit, who has access to liquidity at different stages of the cycle, there's power in that. And actually, that's also the case at the level of nation states. And here we're inspired in part by the geographer Richard Peet uh, in his book on the geography of power uh, that is important. We can generalize to the case of monetary. Now, just a slide to remind us of the global architecture of the, the of power and finance. Um, in the post Bretton Woods world, what we've seen was that the Federal Reserve steps up in 1980s uh, in, the, in the midst of the Latin American, the so-called triple crisis actually in the US, uh, this, the thrifts, right? The, the oil patch loans in Latin America uh, and the Fed rescues its insolvent money center banks. Um, at the same time, the US was an current account, account deficit and that was paralleled by its, of course, capital account surplus all of this was based in those years on the exorbitant privilege of the US dollar and the need for safe haven assets in this world of you know, frequent financial crises. So this it was a stable regime. It's been a stable regime conferring positional power, the ability to define the rules of the game on the nation that is importing this capital. Uh, this nation deregulates, forces others to follow in a sense of France and Germany and others and, and so on, and basically permits the rise in the global penetration of this U.S. mega bank centered shadow banking system. This is the system, of course, that levers up and becomes, you know, is, is, is part of the story of the collapse of the Anglo-American system uh, between the subprime crisis and the euro crisis that's so well described by Adam Tooze. So what we have here is this global pyramid, as Jane DeRista has called it, where there's a country at the top that basically as it, that is at the nexus of financial global power. And this suggests that uh, basically, you know, that U.S. holding U.S. liabilities is a way to support financialization globally, while basically destabilizing governments and allowing uh, government policies and allowing predation elsewhere. Now. The first test of a sovereign nation's financial power is whether its residents and businesses can use the currency that it issues in everyday transactions. You know, and then once that's established, is your currency held in reserve stocks by other nations? And we've seen again, Nino's work in particular shows that there's a very thin and Bianca Orsi, there's a very thin currency hierarchy. Not many countries involved in that. Can it settle contracts outside its borders? Are the financial services, as in the city of London, for third party countries? Um, you know, basically this when you lack financial power, then that's a source of financial fragility because you're going to have to borrow from overseas lenders in foreign currencies, not your currency. Um, now, one way to overcome the dependency that this induces if you lack financial power is to build up uh, a current account surplus, enter into the global factory and basically build that trade surplus as part of what you're going to do. Now, when we look at the world as it's evolved, you know, what we see is that global manufacturing has been distributed very asymmetrically. And we see in particular the rise of East Asia. This is across time, global shares of manufacturing value added. Uh, we see the, you know, of course, the, the prominence of China uh, and and we see Germany kind of hanging on, uh, but basically other countries, you know, going down. So we see this kind of global shifts of, of uh, and notice that Latin America here goes toward an increasingly vulnerable position in this global system. So we argue that there's, we can say that there's a global financial or neoliberal global triad, locations along three dimensions. There's, you know, the hegemony, the dollar, who's got the dollar? Where are the mega banks? How many do you have? How close are you to the dollar if you don't have the dollar? Do you have a, a, hege a semi hegemonic currency that's easily tradable into the dollar and so on? Um, and then the third dimension is the global factory. So we have two kind of extreme positions in this in the world. One is the financial core of the global system, uh, the US itself. 
this safe haven of mega banks and so on. Um, and at the other extreme is the manufacturing core, East Asia and especially China. These cores are interdependent. They trade with each other, right? There's your China-US trade right there. Um, and the US, uh, the Chinese holdings of US treasuries. Uh, but other nations can be, their global positions can be measured in their distance from these poles. There's also a, an extensive peripheral margin here. So we can go beyond, a step beyond Minskian financial fragility, and we can think about global financial fragility. We have not just, you know, whether or not entities in a given country can uh, take care of the cash flow obligations that their debt claims have loaded them with, but we can also think of country risk, you know, that the possibility that a loan made to borrowers in a certain nation perhaps cannot be made good. Then there's exchange rate risk, and this goes to right that that currency crisis we saw on the other page. The possibility that claims or assets in a given currency may devalue because of the movement of markets against it. These are forms of of financial fragility that remind us of some of the lessons of, of Minsky about the importance of balance sheets, but are somewhat different in that they occur at different scales. They occur more at global scales. Um, and, you know, the idea here is that nations that are at the poles of these, uh, these, these uh, uh, triad are immune from speculative attack. China and the U.S. Uh, in particular are super immune but as you go away from those poles, you are exposed to this various forms of global financial fragility. And basically you can, you can react to this by trying to uh, offset your, by acquiring what we call you know, suggestively defensive power, and this is a good word. Uh, you can set up inward capital controls. You can try to ensure that uh, the capital that's imported is used productively. Um, or, in particular, you can build up excess stocks of foreign exchange reserves uh, so that you're, you, you gain the power to be left alone. And what you'll see here in the next couple of slides is examples of countries building up excess reserve stocks, actions that would be irrational except to understand the importance of defensive power. So first of all, we'll just look at India and Brazil uh, and just to, to note that whether you measure it in billions of US dollars or as a share of GDP, the two axes, both of these countries have uh, serious current account uh, problems. Um, and actually, if we're then going to look at the net international position of both countries and what we see here is actually there's been an increase in reserves assets held. Now that goes along with that current account deficit for India and other investments going down in net, right? So the net position is falling, but reserves are increasing. It is over borrowing to protect its reserve pile. And actually the same thing can be seen with Brazil. Brazil builds up and sustains its defensive position on foreign currency reserves, even while its net portfolio investments are down and uh, other positions are deteriorating. So, you know, the, these positions by the, these patterns obtained for all of Latin America. And so this subordinate global position of Latin America um, is something that is sustained uh, through, you know, through time. And now Latin America remains trapped in uneven development. Uh, you know, previously, we these nations were unable to accumulate capital uh, so as to build up a proper industrial sector. But now their lack of industrialization uh, and their lack of manufacturing, their their distance from the global factory makes them these nations dependent on exports from core countries, core producing countries and on the U.S. dollar. They're doubly peripheral. They're peripheral along both the financial and the industrial dimensions. And this combined with the, their dependence on exporting commodities creates extremes of wealth and poverty and leads to ever increasing industrial financialization. Here's just a picture for all of Latin America. There's the uh, current account erosion 
and the uh, reserve asset positions, you know, the one growing, the other. So you see, it's a, it's true for the continent as a whole, or the yeah, the subcontinent. And there is again for the Latin America as a whole, all the countries, we see the same patterns of over borrowing, so as to those assets are the uh, current, uh, the uh, currency assets, so as to protect themselves. So we see in wrapping up the argument here, the two arms of the trap. The current account deteriorates and oscillates wildly. On the other hand, because of these weak currencies, they've had to build up reserve assets. Um, global mega banks, right, which they don't have access to, are playing kind of a guard laborer, a guard dog role. Uh, basically, the, the financial attacks will be taken from time to time to take gains from those that are exposed, that are globally financially fragile and cannot defend themselves. That's why you see the buildup of reserves. So this overborrowing of reserves is to basically back off the guard dogs. And notice that it's specifically the nations that have begun to enter into the global marketplace not so long ago, we were talking about Brazil entering in and taking off, but it's now Brazil and other neighboring nations in Latin America that are most exposed to this predation. A lot of the low income developing countries never make it this far. They're not in the market and they're not the subject of this kind of unwanted attention. So uh, Borio's notion that uh, there's an excessively expansionary monetary policy doesn't apply to Latin America, as we as we've noted, and basically what Ray and her co-authors are ignoring is that the U.S. is that it produces safe assets. You know, in addition to maintain its position, its pole position and financial power, it's not just that it you know generates de government deficit, which of course it's doing all the time now, um, but uh, and has done for these last 30, 40 years. Basically, it's it's protecting its mega bank dominated shadow banking sector. This is a nexus. This power is there, and this you know kind of pushes the U.S. into a corner where it really has no options. And just to conclude, so this post-crisis literature on global financial cycles argues that there's this kind of unstoppable force that limits the autonomy of national macro policy. What we see here is that. Now there's other things going on. There's global structural power involved and uh, basically uh, Keynesian uncertainty in particular is at work. And in this nexus, Latin America is developed enough that it's not in the low income category, but it's far from both poles. It's subject to currency instability. It has a withering manufacturing capacity it's, there's a dependence on foreign capital and debt. And basically, these are all consequences of the asymmetric structure of global financial power in the midst of a global system that itself has a polarized and ultimately, in the longer run, unsustainable structure of global manufacturing and trade. So, you know, the support pillars sustaining this system for now remain in place. The central banks of the key currency nations the global mega banking system appears rock solid now. And of course, people are be being immiserated around the world as a consequence of this. Um, and it won't last forever. But for now, even as the political foundations of this system give way, as was dramatically seen in the United States just a few weeks ago, um, they haven't given way yet. And we're stuck with this awful contradiction this world of the neoliberal uh, global tri triad. Thank you for your attention and let's open up the floor.